Steve, what are your earliest memories of rock and roll in New York City? My earliest memories of rock and roll in New York City? I feel like I'm on the prices, right? Um, you mean when I was involved with it or, or? Not even when you were involved. I mean, who, what was the first concert that you remember seeing in, in the city or clubs even before you I was were a folk musician. You know, one of the, uh, the, the concerts that I used to, I used to go to clubs in the village in early 60s and see like uh, Dave Van Runk and Tom Paxton and beginnings of Peter, Paul and Mary and stuff like that. Play the Gaslight. And I used to be the kid with phony ID that went drinking with all these people at the bar called the Kettle of Fish. And then there was a whole bunch of us actually. Uh, there were kids that were into country blues. I was one of them. And there were kids that were into bluegrass and old timey music. And we, we were trying to figure out what music we could play together. So what we started doing was, we started a jug band called the Even Dozen Jug Band. And that was the first band I was in. Cut, please. Yeah, that's <coughs> we're picking up a lot. Yeah. Can we stop for a moment? <coughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Speed. Steve, what are your memories of, of New York and the New York musical scene in the 60s? Well, I grew up with the folk music. I started playing uh, country blues on acoustic guitar. And uh, there were a whole bunch of us in, in Greenwich Village in the early 60s, kids. We were like the generation before uh, guys like Dave Van Ronk and Tom Paxton and Phil Oaks, Bob Dylan. And uh, there were like two groups of people. There were people who played country blues, blues and there were people that played bluegrass music, old-timey music. And we got together and formed a band that we could all play the same music, and it was called the Even Dozen Jug Band. And uh, basically, that was, that was it. What were some of the clubs that people were playing in, in the village then? There was the Gaslight. That was, that was the club that I used to go to a lot, the Café Wa. Uh, but the Gaslight was uh, where everybody used to hang out, and there were hoot nannies on Tuesday night, and everybody used to go drinking afterwards at the Kettle of Fish next door. I used to have phony ID in those days and uh, drink with all these, the older guys. So was there a real feeling of camaraderie, would you say, among musicians? Oh, yeah. In that scene? Yeah, we wanted to play together. It was just that we grew up with, with different styles. And we made an album for Elektra. Uh, it was just after Jim Kreskin made their first album on Vanguard. What was the original concept for the Blues Project? Uh, it was weird. <laughs> the Blues Project was basically Danny Kalb's band. It was like the Danny Kalb Quartet. And uh, they were playing the, uh, the, uh, the Night Owl, right? It was, a, it was a great place to, I mean, it was a rotten place to play, but there were a lot of great groups that played there, like the Magicians and, and uh, the Flying Machine, James Taylor and Danny Korchmar's group. And, um, uh, Danny's rhythm guitar player, Artie Tram, went on vacation. And Danny came over to a place where I was teaching guitar, Fred and Instruments, and asked me if I would sit in. And I said, sure, you know, but I'll have to put in, on, a pickup on my guitar, which is an acoustic guitar. And it was the first time I played electric, was sitting in with the Danny Kalb Quartet that night. And I was so, I, I couldn't get used to the power coming from the music, coming from another amp, or from an amp. So I, I turned down to zero and just, Looked like, it looked like I was playing. And Danny came up to me afterwards and said, boy, you really play tasty. You have the job. So <laughs> that's how I got that job. But uh, it was just the four of us then. And uh, we went in to record a single for Verve Folkways then called uh, Violets of Dawn, an Eric Anderson song. And uh, we needed a keyboard on the session. And uh, I think it was Phil Ramone or Roy Halley who was producing the record. And they called in Al Cooper. It was the first time we met Al. And we all got along great, and uh, Al decided to be in the band. What do you think? What do you think the legacy of the Blues Project is on on music today? What sort of on today? It's you know it's hard to tell. Here it's actually harder to tell than it is overseas because we never went overseas, and whenever I go, people remember the Blues Project, which is really weird, and I get more of a of a, an objective opinion. Um, I guess we were considered like one of the, ex I, an experimental blues band, a real New York experimental blues band. I, I, don't, I don't think we fit into any category. We never had hit records or anything like that. How did Blood, Sweat, and Tears get together? Oh, well, the, the Blues Project broke up 
and uh, uh, Al Cooper came to New York and wanted to go to England to live. And he had a bunch of great songs, which were on the first Blood, Sweat, and Tears album. And uh, I was uh, hanging out with uh, uh, Bobby Columbia, the drummer. And the three of us, and Freddie Lipsius and Jimmy Fielder, the bass player, uh, we decided to do, uh, Al asked us to do a benefit to raise money for his plane fare to go to England. So we rehearsed and put all these songs together and went down to the Cafe Ogogo and did the benefit. I think about five people showed up. So Al had enough money to get to the airport, and, and that was about it. But we said, well, Al, why don't you just stay here? And, and uh, we were listening to an album called uh, Time and Charges by the Buckinghams then, a lot. And uh, an electric flag, of course. But the uh, Time and Charges album had a horn section from the Chicago Symphony. And uh, we wanted to be able to have that kind of a horn section and take it on the road with us. So we hired the horn, the horn players, three more horn players, because Freddie was already in the band. And they were on salary for the first two weeks. And then we, we made them partners because we couldn't afford the salary. That was the beginning of that band. <laughs> Where'd the name come from? Oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, well, I was in a very compromising position one afternoon, and Al called me up and said, how about blood, sweat, and tears? And I said, great, and hung up the phone. And that was, that's where the name came. I don't know where it came from any more than that. I mean, uh, it's based on a Winston Churchill speech, blood, sweat, to toil, and tears. And also, there was a Johnny Cash album. All that. I don't really know. It was one of Al's ideas. To your mind, do you think that what, what Blood, Sweat, and Tears was doing musically at the time was, was innovative? It, was it different than everything else that was going on? No, absolutely not. I mean, basically what we were doing was just putting together certain influences, lots of influences, jazz and rock and roll. And, and uh, it was really based, the first album was based around Al's, Al's writing, I think, more than anything. But we were just having a good time. The whole album was done in two weeks, on 12 track, I think it was. Could you tell us about Al leaving and David Clayton Thomas joining Blood, Sweat, and Tears? Uh, yeah, we, we decided after the uh, first album, uh, a few of us decided, mutiny. <laughs> we, dis we, we wanted Al to, uh, we wanted to have a, a singer who we felt could get us hit records. And uh, we went to Al and said, we want you to be the leader of the band and the writer and everything that you want, but I think we need another singer. I mean, not for Al not to sing, but just another singer. And Al declined, and uh, he was sort of on his way out anyway. He wanted to do other things. And uh, we just held auditions, actually, and that's how David got into the band. Why do you think the Blood, Sweat, and Tears was so successful? Uh, well, any record is successful be because of the demographics, you know, because of your, your age group and geographically where you're selling your records. And uh, we fit a large demographic. We fit age groups from young people to old people. And it just seemed to work like that. It, it wasn't preconceived or anything. It just happened to work like that. Do you think there is a, a definitive New York sound? Yeah, I think there has been. Do you mean now or, or 20 years ago? Both. Both. Uh, that's hard to say. I think there has been at times. I, I, I think the, uh, the Velvet Underground and the Rascals exemplified it at one time. Uh, now, a lot, the rap records exemplify it now. Uh, Billy Squire, uh, Cindy Lauper, uh, Billy Joel certainly does. But I don't think it's a sound. I think there's just, I think if it, there's a sound at all, it's the sophistication in the songwriting. I think it's just a little bit more sophisticated than, than elsewhere. How difficult is it to make it in New York as opposed to elsewhere? In New York? Well, if you're playing good music, it's pretty easy because the audiences are great. Um, as far as just banging on doors and having doors open for you, it's real difficult. It's real difficult. Are you, <clears throat> are you at all attuned to what is, I know you just mentioned a few names, but what is happening in New York? today as far as any sort of club scene? I mean, you certainly had a very prevalent one in the 60s. It was a, in a small, located area. Yeah, I'm, I'm the wrong one to ask about a club scene in New York because I, do, I work out of the country a lot and out of the city. I live north of the city. I know that and we, I don't dance. <laughs> we had talked a little bit earlier off camera about, uh, about the work that you're doing in Australia now. Mm. How is, is Australia at all comparative 
to Australia now at all comparative to what New York was in the 60s, and if so, how? It is in a way because, because there's a lot of, everybody knows each other. It's a very small town, and, uh, and in New York in the 60s it was then also. And there's a lot of competition, a lot of peer group pressure in, in, in music. And uh, it's also a very naive industry, it's, it's in, in a nice way. And, but the music is so competitive that, that there's a lot of great music over there. And it's, uh, it's very easy to make good records over there. And that's why such good records come from there. That's it for me. I'm going to throw Can up there. Can you think of anything else? <laughs> You're going to throw up no, now? No. Okay. Can you think of anything? I'm fine. <laughs>